space stream. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rolf Hugh. I'll be your moderator for the Cyrus Space uh, stream. We're in session three of this, and our presenter right now is Mr. Jonathan Joint from the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. Uh, he'll be discussing cybersecurity training for the government of Canada. Just as a reminder, uh, the uh, this session will be recorded and posted on the website. And I ask that if you have any questions, please post them in the Q and A section uh, of the uh, of the uh, Zoom interface, and we will present them at the end of the session. So, without further ado, Mr. Jonathan Joint. Thanks very kindly, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so I think I'll just, uh, with the, the time that we have, a few different topics to try to sort of get into in this time frame. So I will dive right in. Uh, as mentioned, we're talking about cybersecurity training in the GC. Um, maybe uh, we'll just start with two quick slides talking a bit about who we are. If you've attended either of the presentations that were delivered by uh, some of my colleagues in the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity, Cyber Center we use as a bit of a short form. Um, you know, already a little bit of talk about uh, our role and what we do, but just just for clarity. Um, so we're a relatively new organization operating under Communication Security Establishment, CSE, um, taking on the primary role of the protective side of CSE's mandate. So the um, protecting uh, systems of, of uh, significance, critical systems to Canadians, including GC systems, and putting a lot of uh, expertise and incident response approaches all in the same place. So there's sort of more organization and integration around that. That was one of the big drivers that integrated incident response element uh, when uh, the Cyber Center was established in 2018, um, plus some outreach uh, and 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 uh, different activities in, um, in uh, different industries and domains. Our the uh, what is now the learning hub used to be uh, part of CSE as well under a different title. I'm 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 a little bit fuzzy on exactly what that title was. Um, I want to think Innovation Center might have been part of part of the role, but don't uh, don't quote me on that. Um, that was a GC only audience. Now the Cyber Center's audience has sort of expanded, so we're looking at governments of different uh, 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 different domains, provincial, territorial, and, uh, municipal, along with that critical infrastructure piece, and then information for the private sector in general, for Canadians in general, um, and academia, healthcare, other domains like that. And I work in the Learning Hub, so we provide training in two primary streams, communication security and cybersecurity. I'm an instructor in the cybersecurity stream. We do a lot of different things um, uh, with, a, I'd, say, I'd say, a relatively low or relatively small profile uh, in the grand scheme of things. Um, we teach in class and virtual instructor-led courses, which I'm involved with. Um, we do e-learning courses that are available online. And a lot of our course selections are either customized in some way or even in some cases lightly tailored. And sometimes a customized course then makes its way into our curriculum uh, because we sort of say, you know, there was a need, this department saw some particular need. They reached out to us and said, we're seeing this particular type of spear phishing attack, or we've got a lot of developers who are looking at secure coding practices. Uh, what uh, what kind of courses can you generate? And then sometimes those make their way after after we've worked through them into our curriculum, in addition to our our own sort of adding adding courses. So that's sort of a bit about who we are. And in presenting to you today, I sort of realized I could talk a lot about that. Um, and at the at the end of the presentation, I'll I'll do a bit of a roundup on what some of our offerings look like, so you get a sense of sort of the expanse of what's available, the types of courses we're offering, um, the space that we are exploring. But I felt there might be some value since I think a number of the people who are joining us today, you might be either involved in training, involved in education, or if not that, at the very least, maybe involved in communicating messages that have to do with um, digital government, that have to do with cybersecurity and cybersecurity adjacent topics. And I thought it could be interesting to explore a little bit about what we've learned about that space uh, in terms of how we deliver messages that are effective, how we um, build training and knowing that there's also going to be any individual who's involved in like um, IT security, decision making, um, cybersecurity implementation in, in different contexts. They're, they're, they're going to be pulling training, not just from us, but from some other places as well. So what can we give them that is a, somewhat unique to our position, and B, is going to mesh well with the other learning that they do. So with that in mind, uh, let's uh, let's dive right in. 
I want folks to think about this, and I don't know if this will generate any questions or sort of be be connected to to, to, to any dialogue. Um, I'm actually thinking when I when I put the deck together, I uh, when I teach, uh, since I'm often doing it virtually, I have an ongoing sort of chat that I'm that I'm I'm following as I go. Uh, today we're going to be sort of tackling questions uh, when we get to the end of the presentation, but I want you to think about the, the this this question it's maybe it feels a little bit philosophical but i think it's it's worth exploring which is is cybersecurity and the way that we protect our systems uh primarily a proactive exercise or a reactive exercise and as you probably guess if i ask a question like this the sort of throwaway easy answer is it's going to be both and yeah that's that's true but what i want to lay lay down here is we frame it in proactive terms most of the time you can go out and look at a lot of tools that are out there and you'll see um, you'll see processes and frameworks, right? So we have we'll have a structure for threat analysis building building on you know like a, a mit the MITRE attack framework, or we'll have um, guidance that we create that is is life cycle guidance for the implementation of security controls. And these are are very, they have structures, they have sometimes hierarchies or or significant categorization and that sort of thing. But first of all, many of them have an aspect that still involves evaluation, evaluation in what the landscape, what the ecosystem looks like. And if we look at how those, um, uh, those structures are created and how they get updated when they get updated, it's almost entirely a response to the threat landscape. So I, I feel, and I think we've learned over time that understanding the reactive quality of cybersecurity is probably one of the biggest keys to teaching in a way that's going to make something work not just now for people, but going forward. Because any new tool, any new um, uh, uh, structure or way of organizing our thoughts and, and, and our, our information and our techniques around cybersecurity, all of those are going to be informed by threats. And if we understand that and we build a foundation that is, is strong in that kind of kind of reactive regard, then I think it makes it a lot easier for us to learn those new tools. And also if we're working in a sort of somewhat siloed or specific, but maybe, maybe um, high technical, high detailed domain that we can see how that domain relates to the bigger context and the bigger picture. And make no mistake, people are doing this all the time. There's lots of, uh, cybersecurity is a domain where the sort of dialogue and, 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 and chatter that comes around concepts is really, really robust. I will have fascinating questions that come to my front door when I'm teaching a specific course, because I have attendees that read this interesting article, they're paying attention to security researchers, they're, 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 they're talking about blogs, they're talking about an incident that happened in their, their organization or another one. Um, sometimes, if I'm being honest, their technical acumen um, ex extends beyond mine, or at least beyond mine in, in some very particular domains. And so being able to have that conversation and contextualize things is an interesting challenge and one uh, that we face, but it's also going to be helpful. And if there's a message that I want to get across, that's going to be part of it is that that reactive quality is actually going to help us in communicating uh, teaching ideas. So uh, a little while ago, I gave a lunch and learn a sort of an, an talk uh, with uh, some some uh, colleagues within my organization and and adjacent to my organization, where I wanted to, um, first of all, I wanted to acknowledge the challenges of, of working in cybersecurity, especially for folks that are newer to the topic, because it is um, one that has sort of monumental depth. And so I came up with three, three interesting thoughts, and they, they might not immediately they might seem sort of out there and off to the side, but hopefully we can, I have a, a way of, of, of pulling them into our understanding about cybersecurity. So the first is the internet was not built with security in mind. So this thing we use where we have put a lot of, well, you know, I'll get to that. That's sort of our, our second point, but we have this big architecture for uh, the internet that plays a role in a lot of work that we do every day, a lot of activities that we do every day. And when it was put together, it was built with flexibility and speed as its underlying strengths, in my opinion. There wasn't any sort of direct tie to identity, no direct tie to uh, non-repudiation, um, to being able to say, this is this person and this person took this action. Um, and there wasn't a security structure sort of baked into that. 
which means we sort of layered our security on top of of the structure that was put in place. It'd be kind of interesting to talk to the people who came up with the initial protocols and concepts around the internet and and sort of wonder if they would have foreseen the fact that we, you know, stream content and have cloud-based service delivery and and a million other ways that we use uh, that we use the internet. And so really we built like the concept of a the human colossus sort of our knowledge our information our communication systems the way our vehicles work and our cities work and infrastructure works the way we run government the way we handle information the way we watch movies and television and listen to music it is entirely built on this foundation and this foundation was not built with security flex, uh security or sort of identity in mind so those two things make this space challenging interesting, fascinating, and challenging. And if you just take a moment to consider the scope of what we do online, I mean, what activities can you think about that have no connection to some kind of online aspect, that don't have some kind of support connection, uh, um, integration in some way of, of, the, of the internet? And in the GC, this is extremely true, right? Service delivery, user portals, cloud offerings, secure channels, the fact that we do telework and you know, beyond that GC context as well, finance, goods, services, education, entertainment, security, communication, so much is there. So with those two things in mind, there is nearly endless room for creativity in how we use those tools. And that same creativity means there's endless room for exploitation. So that's kind of what we're facing. Right. The uh, again, without getting too philosophical, I, I like talking about this stuff, but I know I can, I can probably get carried away. Um, but creativity drives innovation and also drives threats and exploitation. As soon as you have a system that has it baked into it significant value and um, uh, trusted structure, people are going to find ways, going to sort of explore ways to try to extract that value and. And the, pe the people who do so aren't going to play by the rules that we set in place for how we intended that system to be used, right? If you have a system built on trust, people will explore how that trust can be subverted. And if we wanna understand this potential threat space, because that's going to feed into our reactive understanding of cybersecurity, so we can do a better job of learning about cybersecurity, we need breadth. We really need a wide, a wide breadth. We need to start thinking about attack surfaces, goals and motivations of the threat actors, techniques. And we also need to recognize that what we know doesn't encompass everything. And so my, my takeaway in this lunch and learn, I was sort of then, I then went into a lot, a lot of different topics that we explore and how they're interconnected. But one of the big messages was to people who were new, like it's, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot and it's kind of frightening. Know that that's not just because one person is struggling with some of the technical ideas. It's really kind of the nature of the space that we work in, that we operate in, um, et cetera. Okay, so what can we do about it? How do we train people? in a rapidly changing, complex, dynamic environment, one where things are constantly moving. Second question, how do we train people to recognize that they are in a rapidly changing, complex, and dynamic environment, to recognize context and the fact that context can shift? Um, uh, and I'll, I have a sort of an example that I'll dive into in a second, but I wanna get sort of all three questions on the board here. Third question, how do we train people in order to manage risk that is influenced by that environment, right? Our, our, our risk and our understanding of that risk is um, pretty wide open by virtue of the nature that we were just talking about. So there's a few things to, to, to get across here. We need to be pretty versatile and adaptive. Um, we need up-to-date materials and approaches. We need to make sure we have options on the sort of learning side, and we need to acknowledge the environment. In fact, to some degree, I believe, and I'm sure there might be some people that, that, uh, that disagree with me, but I believe that almost a conversation like this has value, has value for starting to recognize, recognize this landscape and recognize how human uh, the threats are in a sense that they're driven by people and they're driven by people's creativity and willingness to explore subversion and explore what they can do, how they can, how they can um, play with the expectations of a given system. Um, and the second point, 
well, this is where I believe most of what the uh, Learning Hub offers tends to be contextual and a little bit more geared towards the general case. That isn't to say that we don't have very technical training. Um, and I, I, well, one of my colleagues teaching on uh, speaking to the uh, the uh, Astro tool was talking about its uh, its presence um, on the Learning Hub in in the future. So there's definitely some deep dives and definitely some technical training. But I would say if if anything, there's a a good number of our courses have at least some element of of speaking to that context, so that if someone learns something with us, they can then then as they're exploring a tool, a practice, or understanding their own network or environment that they're working in, they can take the concepts that we've put forward and, and apply them and see where things, see sort of where, where things um, stick, which means also we need open-ended concepts. So uh, one of my favorite courses to develop was our course on targeted social engineering. And it was because we got into the psychology of it instead of trying to name typical social engineering um, uh, attacks and approaches, we said, well, here's what they're doing when we really break down the, the psychology. And there's, you know, make no mistake, there's other, there's other uh, um, information sources and, and learning, learning tools and, and uh, courses that, that will, will take that same, same perspective. But that one probably has some of the, uh, some of the most value. And maybe to maybe uh, kind of put an underline on that, if you get a room of people and you're talking about social engineering and you ask them like, what's an early example? One of the ones that almost always comes to the fore is the Nigerian prince scam email. And when, when we teach that, someone will bring up, someone will laugh. They'll sort of say, that's funny. It's kind of a ridiculous over the top concept. Who would fall for that? And as soon as I started hearing people say that, I realized the pitfall, which is if you're teaching something that has a risk or a threat element, and you teach to what we've seen in the past, and you focus significantly on that, you might have some people that say, well, I know what a phishing email looks like. It looks like a Nigerian print email. I know how to spot that. I'm not going to fall for it. And that's kind of a risk, right? It's a risk for us uh, uh, realizing that maybe our learners have duped themselves into thinking uh, that they have a more fulsome perspective on the subject than they actually do. So we, we, we need to be open and aware uh, and, and teach to breadth, right? So psychological techniques for social engineering, how authentication has evolved, how it's changing over time, um, why thing, like why a, a concept like multi-factor authentication, um, why that works and how that plays out. Um, how penetration testing has evolved, vulnerability scanning um, being on the rise and different tools uh, related to that, how open source intelligence works. Uh, we've had had some examples where we, we sort of get people to almost put themselves in the shoes of the threat actor to say, if I want to attack a government department, what are the open source angles that I could use? What kind of information is available out there that would give me a hook in, in trying to um, attack and compromise a government department, because in doing so, then the people who are protecting that government department can can think a bit more fulsomely about that and realize the breadth of what they might be facing. Okay, so what does that model kind of look like in course delivery? Well, um, it it's it's not there's no um, fixed uh, consistent. Um, approach uh, to exactly how we put a course together, but we've noticed increasingly a, a so somewhat consistent model that's kind of been evolving over time. So first we start with sort of context and language. I try to get through that pretty quickly because that can be a little bit dry, but we, we want that approachability and make sure that we know um, what, what we're dealing with when we use different terms and different ideas, and that we also build a context of like, what's workplace teams roles, current events, what do threats look like? Uh, what does the thing we're studying the activity or action look like? Um, uh, the, uh, the, I actually find too, I've encountered a number of definitions that sometimes can miss the mark. So we do a lot of talking about that, about how one term might be used slightly differently in different contexts to make sure people are, are, are live to that. Then we build our understanding of threats, threats um, in the domain that we're teaching. So if it's a general course, this might be a general looking at a, a sort of expanse of different different threats. If it's uh, if we're talking about a course on 
on uh, uh, secure development, then those threats are going to relate to what kind of threats against software and you know, tactical threats on the logic model of software, um, uh, SQL injection and buffer overflows and cross-site scripting and you know, things, things of that nature. Um, then from those threats, build our understanding of countermeasures. So if we're going to teach you about um, a tool, about a process, about security controls that can be applied, about even how we consider security controls, how we explore that space, about uh, technologies that we can layer over top of, uh, of what we're doing, about hardening, about um, uh, the human element and uh, awareness uh, on, 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 the, on, the, on the process side, we're going to link those countermeasures back to our threats so that we're, we, we can say, here are the actions and activities that are going to be responsive to that. And, and you'll know why, because we described how the threat works and how the countermeasure um, uh, sort of plays, plays there. Uh, we'll think about effort and attention, what kind of uh, uh, requirement is there? Can we make something a little bit more, um, more natural for people? Uh, then to sort of uh, solidify and cement things, we'll build case studies and we'll link them uh, to our learning activities. Now, we'll pull from real world examples for case studies, but it's not just that. It also is the time. And I should be clear that last bullet kind of plays out across the whole course, but um, if anything is emphasized at the end, it's not just real world uh, case studies, but also things that the participants will bring to us to say, you know, and we'll, we'll encourage that uh, something that they encountered something that they uh, that they sort of uh, dove into. So if we explained this model, well, let's map that model to the, um, the example that they're, they're raising. What does that mean in terms of our threat assessment and the sophistication there? What type of security controls would be relevant? Why did something work? What failed in terms of a weakness of uh, vulnerabilities in our security uh, control kind of structure? So that's really, this is our model. Um, uh, again, it's not universal for our courses, but it's pretty common. Uh, and it's been working very, very well. It uh, foments a dialogue. I have some examples there of sort of breaking down authentication and how we think about it, about um, uh, tech, uh, tech TTP of, uh, of threat actors, about uh, countermeasures against certain TTP, and then some of our learning activities and, and examples that we dive into. Okay, so other places we can pull from things. Well, we work we're very fortunate to work in the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. There's lots of really rich information. Sometimes I'm able to go and speak to colleagues that have, have a view into, into these domains to customize things for a course. Sometimes I'm pulling from publicly sourced information, but things that we produce like the Nat National Cyber Threat Assessment. Really, really good document for building a understanding of kind of where we are, what, what is Canada facing in terms of threats. Okay, so techniques, I already sort of started to get into that, uh, the slide before, before last, but just to get a sense. So we build a case study uh, or a tech demo if we're actually talking about uh, a specific tools that people will, will, will use. Um, and as I mentioned, not just case studies, but also mapping exercises where we take something that someone has encountered themselves and we map it to what we have just explored. Uh, that the sort of flow chart on the right is kind of a, a simple example of that. You know, we have someone at a course who talks about, well, oh, the other day I was trying to help, um, you know, an uncle of mine who opened an attachment that installed malware. So then we can say, well, what did they receive? What did it look like? Why? What action did they take or not take? What's actually being used? What what kind of threat is that? Um, and uh, and how might it have worked? Maybe we know those details. Maybe we don't. But we can dive into them a little bit. Uh, we explore impact and harm because that's really going to tell us something as well about about what what these threats mean if they are realized. And then how could we have mitigated? And how do we mitigate going forward? What kind of lessons have we learned? So that would be sort of a mapping example. Open dialogue, kind of the same thing. Uh, concepts that get explored because someone raises them, and we we get into the nuance of of these of these concepts. We have so those those three are sort of those first three bullets are kind of related to the way the course looks and the way the interaction happens with learners, and then um, internally we have a life cycle for our training material, so it's getting reviewed on a regular basis. Um, a number of colleagues and I make smaller changes on a very regular basis. You know, I, we we teach the course and then say, you know, I came across an example in the news that is a little bit stronger. Let's sub that in, or there's a, been a small change somewhere in text or or policy, something along those lines, and then bigger ones on a life cycle basis uh, every um, 
um, typically every every couple of years uh, where we're diving really into the details of a course. Well, we engage, as I mentioned, SMEs and experts internal to our organization. I'm very fortunate to do that. And uh, it helps me bounce off the, you know, this is the way I've been describing this. Does this resonate with what we know from a, from a, a, a high sophistication and expert, expert um, example? And luckily, uh, yeah, the vast majority of the time that's been the case. And I, it's really, really good for, for me to have that back and forth as an instructor. And also in some cases, we've pulled some of those people into the courses we've been teaching when they're sort of taught in person. Um, as for particular audiences. And then as mentioned, sort of an underlying thing that we've been talking about already kind of through, through the presentation today is linking our security practices to threats and addressing biases and misunderstanding. And I actually, I would say the, uh, the Nigerian Prince example there is, is exactly that. It's, I bring that up and I describe it kind of similarly to what I did just now, maybe a little slower because I'm, I'm moving fairly quickly in the, in the time that we have today, but it, actually calling out the fact that we are prone to things like functional fixedness. You know, we expect them to go through this door, so that's what's going to happen, or confirmation and congruence biases, right? So we we test the, the system the way we intended it to be used, and we say, we know what this looks like because we've seen it before, and we look for the same type of example and not, not outliers. A lot of other things, recency and base rate, uh, base rate fallacies, things that I think about a lot in terms of how I communicate uh, with with learners, and we also try to throw a little bit of humor in there too, right? Um, I always like talking about every time we get into sort of hacking and logical hacking techniques, you you can always sort of bring up it doesn't look like it does on TV, and then you know throw in that. Uh, that uh, I think it's NCIS, the television program where you have two people typing at a keyboard as fast as they can, uh, trying to fight a hacker in real time as different things appear on the screen in rapid fire. Uh, and to that end, um, that's another part of our toolkit, keeping it interesting. And I wonder sometimes if I would ever be critiqued for this because I sometimes realize when I've been teaching, I'm talking about a topic and I'm I'm speaking from the perspective of somebody who is the threat actor. I'm sort of putting myself in their shoes and speaking to the way they are approaching attacking a system. Um, and and I that you know I have to give sort of that disclaimer, like I don't advocate for this. Um, uh, I'm you know we're we're on the tensive security side, but because of the complexity of of what we're exploring here, it's easier to explain it to you that way. But there's also another thing, and that's that the threats themselves are fascinating. And I would also say to, to, to a, a maybe ever so slightly lesser degree, but still uh, very significantly, the responses and the new technolo technological approaches that we use are also fascinating. So again, this is another callback to real world examples, case studies, mapping exercises, just like we were talking about, because they resonate. Uh, on the right there, you have How I've Been Pwned. I'm guessing some of you might be familiar with that. Uh, security researcher website talks about, gives you a sense of privacy breaches and the information that's out there on the dark web and on other sources. And so I can, I can paint that picture of, you know, them alone with what they've found. They have uh, almost 12 billion uh, compromised accounts. So if I want to teach people about not reusing their password or not using simple passwords, I have context that is A, fascinating, and B, stays with them of, of understanding that risk and understanding that threat. Likewise, real examples of a sextortion email or in the GC where we had um, fraud that, ha that went via the authentication uh, system used by CRA by virtue of the fact that people who use that system were reusing their, their usernames and passwords in other places. And that, that, that paints that picture as well. Here's a quick example of one. Uh, we use it in a few courses. So, you know, we're talking, this is usually pretty early in a course, probably module one, where we're giving that context and these are these ideas. And we talk about cybersecurity goals. If you have explored this space, you might have heard of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and the, the unfortunately poorly chosen acronym of CIA. Um, <clears throat> but what I do is I get, I get my learners, I say, let's think about a system where confidentiality is extremely important. And then let's think about an attack against confidentiality. And then I do the same with integrity and availability. And you kind of get that, you know, these are, these sound like kind of high minded concepts, but this is really the way we categorize information in the GC. If you think about protected ABC and, and classified secret top secret, um, it, it's the way we think about what security controls protect our systems. Uh, and it is applicable to just about any example that we want to explore. So 
uh, this this would be a good example of like an kind of ice breaking dialogue on on the topic at hand. Um, okay, so with that, I, I, I'll stop there just for a quick second. I wanted to give an example. Uh, I have five to ten minutes uh, more to sort of speak right now. What we've talked to up to this point in this in this in this brief window is to give a sense of some of the things we've learned and some of the things that we're exploring and what's been I believe working very well with our course offerings. I love delivering uh, uh, courses. I've I've always been sort of concerned from my from where I come from expertise wise that. Um, uh, th there's always a bit of that sense of there's more learning to do. There's deeper dives to get into the tech technology side of things. Um, you know, I've talked about uh, courses for developers. Um, I was a developer like 25 years ago. It's been such a long time that I I can't pull a lot of expertise into into that that kind of domain. Um, but in terms of uh, you know, while I worry about those things, in terms of the way that we can connect contextual ideas to technical things that are being taught seems to be working very well. And if there's a takeaway for you, it's this. This is what I sort of wanted to bring today is think about the way we do this sort of messaging, the way we explain threats and deal with the reactive side of cybersecurity in order to build up awareness and teach concepts to people. And then the next bunch of slides are kind of just talking about, okay, well, what, what do we actually have to, have to offer? So I already described our audience uh, in, in, in the Learning Hub. Um, our primary goal, well, actually, it's worth mentioning within that audience, we also sort of have to think about expertises and sophistication, right? We need to be providing uh, context for experts and helping them increase their skills, uh, explore maybe new topics that, uh, that, that uh, they haven't dived, dove into as much. Um, we're also in the business of helping new experts sort of emerge and grow, someone who's um, joining and diving into cybersecurity for the first time. We created a boot camp that's been really, really valuable. And I remember uh, when we first completed that and, and uh, my, my colleague sort of was a lead on that and I, I was supporting him with a lot of the, the material, I said, if I could have taken this boot camp five to 10 years ago, it would have been exactly what I needed to get super interested in cybersecurity. And I might have joined joined this particular part of that industry. I've, I've been I've been cybersecurity adjacent for for many, many years. Um, uh, privacy is sort of where, where, where my background is. Uh, but uh, it, it, it would have been fantastic for that. So so that boot camp is a really good example of something that would help give people hey, here are the many areas you could explore and how they are interconnected, and also starting with that foundation to become an expert in, in this domain. And then we have teaching that we think is actually valuable for just about everyone. So I'll mention really quickly, we partnered recently with the Canadian School for um, a Public a public Service, the CSPS, uh, on, a, on a course. Uh, I, I had a, a, a significant role in its, in its development and design. Um, that is now available. Uh, the the code is, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm saying this out loud, but I can. I'm I'm not sure if I can. I, if there's a chat, I can put it in. But it's DDN two three five, which is it's it's like an hour, hour and a half long course, a sort of foundational beginner course for cybersecurity. But it's going through the process of being looked at as a potential um, mandatory training. I know that adds to the mandatory training perspective in in the GC, but it's also extremely valuable and pretty pretty um, um, direct in terms of getting a lot of good ideas and information across in about an hour's worth of time. So so that's part of that goal of trying to build this resilience for everyone and getting awareness and information out there. And we've been uh, very lucky to be able to work with uh, the Canada School on that. Uh, we like emphasizing the idea that cybersecurity is a team sport. It's not just about experts with a you know network and IT specific background. There's technical and non-technical players, um, and it's very essential that we keep on bringing people into that, especially since there's such a significant talent gap right now that we're trying to fill with uh, people. And sometimes someone who's non-technical can lean into that technical path, um, uh, but but also having a background in communications or or law or policy that connects to this is we need those people as well that's very important and they're going to be part of the uh, potential participants in the courses that we deliver uh, so i kind of already hinted at this but we have i have a quick screen grab of the landing page for the learning hub um, 
we've we have a div division on the landing page between cybersecurity and IT and cloud security. The the significant difference there is if we're teaching something that is very policy driven and structured around GC, like um, uh, cloud cloud security and risk management in a GC context, those fall into the IT and cloud security uh, course offerings. Just about everything else on the cybersecurity side falls into cybersecurity, where you're dealing with more, more of the broad, just kind of like I've been talking, you know, broad, broad-based, context-based perspective across um, across domains, or in terms of particular threat methodology or particular countermeasure methodologies. Uh, and then we also we also teach on the communication security side. We've had philosoph philosophical debates on where Comsec fits into the bigger cybersecurity picture. Uh, as mentioned, e-learning and instructor-led, virtual, in-person, and hybrid, and this custom training, which uh, sometimes has become curriculum training. Uh, um, if you're thinking about this and exploring it, particularly in your department, I'd highly advise you to get in touch with us and look at the group training offerings because it's we are cost recovery, so there is cost to take our courses, but group training is very, very cost effective because there's you can have a lot of people attend a course for a fixed amount of money because it's just the money to cover the costs for us delivering that course. And um, and we've had some some pretty big asks in in uh, where where we're looking at some departments that have asked for like 30, 40, 50 training sequences or, or sessions um, uh, across the next year or two. Uh, so we're, we're actually getting pressed a little bit in terms of, of capacity, but we're also building capacity internally. Okay. I see a few minutes left, so I'll just sort of uh, wrap up the last ideas. First of all, if we were to group like the course offerings and the types we have, there's some of the fundamental ones. So concepts and context, um, some best practices, of course, a 108 course uh, that's fairly new that is really the pillars of what individuals can do to protect themselves from a best practice perspective. And I described our collaboration with uh, the Canada School of Public Service um, on DDN 235. Uh, we have uh, quite a variety that are activity or technology based. So the, those first two being in that IT and cloud security stream, IT risk management and cloud security, and then um, courses on thing, concepts like authentication, internet of things, wireless technology protocols and uh, and um, uh, security controls, operational technology, uh, what's in, generally in the critical infrastructure domain, software development uh, and secure techniques, cryptography, ideas like that. And then on the flip side, ones that are very driven by issues. Now, in both cases, we're going to talk about threats and we're going to talk about countermeasures. But there's ones where just sort of by their title and by their starting point, they either began with the perspective of an activity or technology or ones that began from the perspective of the threat, cybercrime, social engineering, insider threats, and then sort of direct responses to those in, when an incident occurs, event management, tabletop exercises. Um, uh, oh, I, I have incident response, event management and, and, and incident response usually are gonna fall into the same kind of, kind of course bucket. And so from that, if there are takeaways, I would encourage you, if you're being a communicator, you're you're sharing ideas about what uh, what what I'm what I'm talking about today about cybersecurity. If you're involved in um, the move towards an increasingly digital government, and you know that some of the safety and security is part of that perspective, you're trying to get messages across. These takeaways could be valuable to you. I, I hope uh, foster curiosity and exploration. This topic is fascinating leverage that because if you want people to listen um, and and you want to, to grab them and have something that they will then potentially pass on to a coworker or at the very least remember for a longer period of time and uh, tailor their behavior towards those risks, that, um, that, that uh, fascinating curiosity and exploration kind of angle, including the threat side of it is going to be very valuable. Communicate ideas, and then link what you talked about in those ideas to real world examples and lived experience. Link the threat with the security control or countermeasure that is going to, countermeasures that are going to potentially combat that and explain how something might still get through despite the, those countermeasures and how the countermeasures um, apply different aspects and we might need more than one of them. We might need a sort of a layered defense approach. Uh, make sure that you're aligning learners towards future developments, the way that um, threats might change over time. And of course, I have to have a little bit of that idea of, um, 
you know, come to us, uh, leverage our material. Uh, we, we have um, some excellent uh, publications uh, that dive into a great deal of topics for securing systems, understanding cybersecurity, that sort of thing. I, I get to have a hand in doing some review of those and those, those are kind of endlessly fascinating as well, but explore our courses. Uh, some of the e-learning offerings are free. Um, so that's something that uh, someone can can explore. And in terms of instructor-led, like I mentioned, uh, if you have a group or a team or even a larger need in your department, explore that kind of group training idea. Um, maybe to the second last bullet too, I also want to point out the idea of, we have to think about like what technological shifts are going to change our paradigm. What new technology, you know, AI and quantum are coming up a lot. How is that going to change that? How do we maintain our understanding of context and not sort of, not kind of get carried away with where those can go? Um, what social changes in behaviors, the new social media platform, new, new streaming, new behavior, uh, new transparency, the fact that the cyber center and CSE and other entities, the government in general, are much more transparent about nation state threat actors and risks that are out there. Uh, there's probably more hostility during the pandemic. We saw a big rise in attacks. What kind of trends are forming? All of those go into our thinking around this. And really, that's what, what I, I think could be a val value uh, to you. If you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer that. Uh, I think I'm at the end of my time, and uh, I hope this was helpful. So I'll, I'll there's a question slide, but then I'll leave it on this last one in case anyone's looking for our contact information, if you're looking for more details or the link as far as our, um, our learning hub goes. Thank you so much. Cheers. Jonathan, thank you so much. That was so informative. I gained a whole new insight when it comes to IT security training and what I've done in the past compared to what uh, what uh, you guys are doing right now. So let's go into the Q&A. Let's take a look and see what we got. Um, let's see. Does your cloud security training, does your cloud security training generic that can be applied to specific CSPs like Azure or AWS? So with my apologies, I am not the instructor on cloud security, and it's actually I've only taken, I've only taken a couple of the offerings, not the um, not the lengthier sort of more robust offering on cloud. Um, it is aligned to GC policy, so it 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 it's going to hook into um, the potential offerings that can be engaged via GC. So I believe all of those would be on board and I believe it would contextually uh, fit um, in, in, in a lot of different places. It has some of that uh, generic quality, but I don't know the intricacies of GC policy enough to answer that with 100% assurance. My apologies that I don't know for sure, but I, I do believe so. And I think the descriptions for the cloud courses might, uh, might provide a little bit more insight into that as well. Don't hesitate to, to get in touch with us if, if that's a really specific need and I haven't answered it as, as clearly as you'd like if you're contemplating the courses. Okay. Um, I've got a question for you myself, uh, working in projects, I'm being asked about gamification. Mm -hmm. What is your take on that? Uh, as far as the, uh, uh, the, uh, CCCS. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, um, uh, my colleague actually gave a talk on in defense of ethical hacking, and I know they're not the same thing, but I do believe that the ethical hacking approach penetration testing, mm -hmm link those ideas link with gamification so since a lot of what i talked about today was um encouraging understanding context and understanding creativity of threats yeah gamification has a lot of strengths as far as that goes uh i came across um a tool that was uh, like a card game based on a privilege escalation and that you could actually sort of play around a table and it really resonated with there's how many different combinations and, and approaches could threat actors take uh, it it really like we sort of used it briefly as an exercise and it, it it resonated for us. So I'm very much in in favor of that. Remembering that on the specific use case, we have to be really thoughtful of is anything getting lost in the message or so almost like we have to con con give context to that gamification as well, right? Like here here's the game, here's what's resonating. Um, but make sure people see where that fits in the grand scheme and if it didn't cover all of the bases, that we know that that's the case. Okay, but I'm for it. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Uh, we got another question. Mm -hmm. How would you say Canada compares to peer jurisdictions such as the Five Eyes countries regarding the approach and maturity of cybersecurity training programs? I'm actually just diving into that topic um, myself right now. I mean, if we compare to 
uh, the, the UK or the United States. I haven't really looked at how their training program is implemented, but in terms of the resources they have at their disposal with maybe somewhat larger budgets, um, uh, there's a lot that they can do there. We sometimes actually reference our material in conjunction with theirs, but unfortunately, I, I feel like I'm giving these half answers, but I haven't really explored how robust their training programs are. That's something that I want to want to look at in, um, in, in the next little while. I will say this in many of these places um the there's lots of really good work being done but it's still relatively it's still a relatively new topic in terms of us how we really get our handle on effective training for all of those different audiences from technical experts to uh, uh to folks who are just using systems on a day-to-day -day basis and so i think there's there's growth and exploration in in all of those places they might be a little bit ahead uh but uh but I, yeah i i haven't i haven't really explored fully to answer that uh, with more detail okay okay all right if I can mention, I think I, I see a, a Q and A question on the on the quantum side. I don't know if that's. I'm I'm more than happy to sure to, to do my best to answer that. Let's see, wait a minute. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, quantum. Okay. Will quantum computing destroy the encryption system the way we know it today? Can we build security with quantum computing? So quantum computers, and again, from a non-expert example, but but someone who's done a, a fair a fair bit of reading, they're thus far. And likely going forward, they're very purpose specific. So there are uh, cryptographic methodologies that are uh, the solutions to which are very much tied to, uh, can be solved more easily with quantum computing. First of all, I should mention quantum computing is mostly a risk to asymmetric crypt cryptography, not symmetric. Uh, that's now we use that a lot. Uh, that's that's HTTPS and any kind of sort of handshaking that you have uh, is going to have an asymmetric component. There's a whole bunch of uh, certificates and, and and that sort of thing. And asymmetric requires a problem that's easy to solve one way and very difficult to solve the other way. And quantum can sometimes solve it the difficult way, hence breaking cryptography. But it's only if you can build a quantum computer that can solve that type of problem. Uh, so there's lots of investigation going into what they call, uh, refer to as quantum resistant cryptography, um, including in the five eyes, including um, uh, independent of government and internal to government. There's lots of exp exploration in this space. I'm pretty confident uh, that they're going to have um, methods. And I think the big question will be, how do we switch over to those? Like if, if, if we have something that is weak against quantum attacks um, that we're currently using a lot of, like what's the process for making sure we we shift over to a new quantum re resistant approach because we might we might have to. And we, we've seen that before where there's there's some some need because some paradigm changed and it's there's always going to be some vulnerable entities that didn't make the technological shift or you know did almost like they didn't patch in time. So we'll, we'll see how that looks over time, but I'm I'm fairly confident we're going to have a decent number of tools to deal with it. And it's a big problem, but it's not an infinitely big problem. It's 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 uh, definitely I think within our scope to handle. Optimism, I suppose. <laughs> Healthy optimism. I think so. Yeah. There we go. All right. Well, that seems to be all the questions we have at this time. Uh, I'd like to thank Jonathan Joint from the CCCS again for the uh, training presentation today. It was uh, highly informative. Coming up next, we have Upskilling People for the Workplace of the Future, SFIA. Uh, so, with that said, we will end the presentation. And hopefully we'll see the rest of you in the next uh, section. All right. Have a good day. Thanks so much. Have a good day.